In 2014, U.S. put a hold on gain of function research in response to a number of laboratory biosecurity incidents, including anthrax, smallpox, and influenza. In December 2017, NIH lifted this ban because, quote, gain of function research is important in helping us identify, understand, and develop strategies and effective countermeasures against rapidly evolving pathogens that pose a threat to public health. All difficult questions have arguments on both sides. <laughs> yes. Can you argue the pros and cons of gain of function research with viruses? I can. And first, let me say this term, gain of function, is causing such confusion that I need to take a minute and just sort of talk about what the common scientific use of that term is and where it is very different when we're talking about the current oversight of potentially dangerous human pathogens. As you know, in science, we're doing gain-of-function experiments all the time. Uh, we support a lot of cancer immunotherapy at NIH. Right here in our clinical center, there are trials going on where people's immune cells are taken out of their body, treated with a genetic therapy that revs up their ability to discover the cancer that that patient currently has, maybe even at stage four, and then give them back as those little ninja warriors uh, go after the cancer. And it sometimes works dramatically. That's gain of function. You gave that patient a gain in their immune function that may have saved their life. So we've got to be careful not to say, oh, gain of function is bad. Most of what we do in science that's good involves quite a bit of that. And we are all living with gains of function every day. I have a gain of function because I'm wearing these <laughs> eyeglasses. Otherwise, I would not be seeing you as clearly. Mm -hmm. I'm happy for that gain of function. So that's where a lot of confusion has happened. The kind of gain of function, which is now subject to very rigorous and very carefully defined oversight, is when you are working with an established human pathogen that is known to be potentially causing a pandemic, and you are enhancing or potentially enhancing its transmissibility or its virulence. We call that EPPP, Enhanced Potential Pandemic Pathogen. That requires this very stringent oversight worked out over three years by the National uh, Science Advisory Board on Biosecurity that needs to be looked at uh, by a panel that goes well beyond NIH to decide, are the benefits worth the risks in that situation? Most of the time, it's not worth the risk. Only three times uh, in the last three or four years uh, have experiments been given permission to go forward. They were all on influenza. So I will argue that if you're worried about the next pandemic, the more you know about the coming enemy, the better chance you have to recognize when trouble is starting. And so if you can do it safely, uh, studying influenza or coronaviruses like SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2 uh, would be a good thing to be able to know about. But you have to be able to do it safely because we all know lab accidents can happen. And, I mean, look at SARS where there have been lab accidents and people who have gotten sick as a result. We don't want to take that chance unless there's a compelling scientific reason. That's why we have this very stringent oversight. The experiments being done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology as a subaward to our grant to EcoHealth in New York did not meet that standard of requiring that kind of stringent oversight. I want to be really clear about that because there's been so much thrown around about it. Was it gain of function? Well, in the standard use of that term that you would use in science in general, you might say it was. But in the use of that term that applies to this very specific example of a potential pandemic pathogen, absolutely not. So nothing went on there that should not have happened based upon the oversight. There was an instance where the grantee institution failed to notify us about the result of an experiment that they were supposed to tell us where they mixed and matched uh, some viral genomes and got a somewhat larger viral load as a result. But it was not EPPP. It was not getting into that zone that would have required this higher level of scrutiny. It was all bat viruses. These were not human pathogens. 
so they didn't cross a threshold within that gray area that makes for an EPPP. They did not. And anybody who's willing to take the time uh, to look at what EPP means and what those experiments were would have to agree with what I just said. What is the biggest reason it didn't cross that threshold? Is it because it wasn't uh, jumping to humans? Is it because the, it did not have a su sufficient increase in virulence or transmissibility? What's your sense? EPPP only applies <clears throat> to agents that are known human pathogens <clears throat> of, potem of pandemic potential. These were all bat viruses derived in the wild, not shown to be infectious to humans. Just looking at what happened if you took four different bat viruses and you tried moving the spike protein gene from one into one of the others uh, to see whether it would bind better to the ACE2 receptor, that doesn't get across that threshold. And let me also say, for those who are trying to connect the dots here, which is the most troubling part of this, and say, well, this is how SARS-CoV-2 got started, that is absolutely demonstrably false. Uh, these bat viruses that were being studied had only about 80% similarity in their genomes to SARS-CoV-2. They were like decades away in evolutionary terms. And it is really irresponsible for people to claim otherwise.